Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn how to be awake and aware, the science of becoming a better human and society. My first guest is Dr. Stuart Shanker. He is a distinguished research professor emeritus of philosophy and psychology at York University and founder of the Merit Center. He is a world-leading authority and best-selling author on the topic of self-regulation and child development and the former president of the Council of Early Child Development. He's the author of a few books, but today we're talking about his latest, Reframed Self-Reg for a Just Society. Welcome back, Stuart. It's lovely to be with you again. Thank you, Lisa. That was a very nice introduction. Well, it's all you, my friend, all you. (laughs) What does it mean to be self-regulated? You know, uh, we did a study a couple of years ago that you won't know about, and uh, our our scientists discovered there are 447 different definitions of self-regulation. So, yeah, but we actually used the first one, the one I was trained in. Um, And that just means how do we handle stress? And the thing about how we handle stress, which starts from the moment of birth, if not before, is we can do it in a way that is actually maladaptive. Uh, And what that means is, uh, you know, maybe we can deal with the stress in the moment, but we create more stress down the road. So, you know, that tub of Ben and Jerry's might get you through the, you know, what you're feeling at this at this moment, but uh, maybe it's not such a great habit as you go forward. Uh, and then we can self-regulate in ways that actually make us grow, that actually uh, benefit not just our mind, but our body. So that's the work that we do, uh, especially with children and teens. Um, we see an awful lot of kids now that are hooked on maladaptive ways of self-regulating, and we work very hard to shift them to get them into adaptive, uh, you know, growth-promoting ways of dealing with stress. So when we talk about self-regulation in the context of what everybody in the world has encountered in the last year or so, yeah. there are patterns in all of us that have emerged that I would say are maladaptive in the self-regulation department. And maybe you could point out a few of the obvious and what the uh, immediate effects and the projected long-term effects are. Well, let me answer it in two different ways. Let's look at it first at the level of the individual. Uh, So what we've seen over the past 12 months, okay, COVID is obviously a huge stress for all of us. Uh, But what we've seen is a tripling and the prevalence or the incidence of anxiety disorders and depression uh, in all ages, but especially in children and teens. So what that tells us is that whatever it is that an awful lot of uh, kids or parents are doing, um, it's maladaptive. It's actually making uh, the situation worse. And then if we look at, uh, you know, if we look at the larger issue of how societies are doing, you know, in the U.S., uh, you've got a very glaring example of maladaptive self-regulation. And that's, uh, you know, the polarization, which is very, very uh, dramatic in the U.S. But in fact, um, there is an epidemic of polarization throughout the world. We're seeing uh, society after society becoming polarized. And this, again, this is a sign of a society that's dealing with its stresses. Um, and this goes far beyond COVID. This was a, a trajectory that was happening many years ago. 
um, we're not dealing well with our stresses and the polarization is uh, just one manifestation of that. So, um, you know, when we look at the importance of self reg at least, you know, that's what I'm up to in this book, it's to give parents or teachers tools uh, so they can recognize when a kid is using maladaptive ways and, and shift them. But it's also for us as, as citizens to recognize that we are overstressed, uh, figure out why we've become so overstressed, and then begin the road to recovery. When we talk about polarization, the, the, the reasons why we are so polarized, is it fear of the unknown? Is it that we're, I mean, what is it? Can, can you pinpoint in your research and experience what is causing this discord and this rift? So you, so you know, that's a real tough question, right? Um, and, yeah. uh, and the short answer is that um, excessive stress is what causes polarization. Now, stress is a very complicated concept. So we use the term in the scientific sense. So a scientific, scientifically, a stress is anything that requires the brain to burn energy. So we burn energy to keep our systems running. We started an exercise some time ago where we began to tabulate the different kinds of stresses involved. And if you go onto our website, which is self-reg.ca, uh, you can download for free a what's called a stress inventory, a list of the different kinds of stresses. It's actually very useful. But it turns out that there are hundreds of stresses. And so what we ended up doing is uh, something called factor analysis. We grouped them all into five basic categories. And we think these five categories capture the different kinds of stresses, uh, all the different kinds of stresses we're under. So the five categories are, are physical stress, uh, the stress of crowds, the stress of too much stimulation, noise. Uh, emotional stress, and that's easy to figure out. Cognitive stress, and that's a very interesting one, especially for all the work that we do with children. A lot of the new book, Reframed, is about recognizing when a child is essentially doing badly in school because of cognitive stress, and the kinds of things we can do to relieve that cognitive stress, which are successful. And then finally, we have social stress. And again, that's you, you can figure that one out. And um, what we call pro-social stresses, the stresses that we impose on ourselves. So when we try to answer a question like you raised, you know, is it fear or, you know, anxiety that's pr produced this state of polarization? Our own answer is, you know, there's an awful lot of stresses that we have to factor in. Stresses that began to manifest uh, around the middle of the 1990s, if you can believe it. We have various measures that we use that tell us that the stress load, well, I'll just stick with the U.S., that the stress load on Americans suddenly started to ratchet up around 95, and it's been going up every single year. And we have all kinds of measurement, all kinds of ways of measuring that so we can look at things like obesity rates or health measures. Um, there's a lot of stress in American society. And what's happened is, you know, a reflection that the stress got too great. And when stress gets too great, uh, our ability as a society or, you know, as an individual, if our stress is too great, we go into something called red brain and we have very limited capacity to solve problems when we're in red brain. Is that, is, is that too long an answer for your question? No, it's a long and good answer. And then in my mind, I'm rolling back the tape in my mind's eye to 1995, looking mm -hmm. at what could have been the turning point. And one of the things that I think of, which may or may not be correct or even relevant, is the ubiquitousness of the home computer. So right. that's a real interesting uh, – th th seriously, Lisa, that's a really interesting response. So let me say two things to that, okay? Yes, First please. of all, what you, you just – you, <laughs> Well, what you just did is exactly what we all need to do. Um, you put on your analytic cap, you know, starting to uh, – uh, you know, starting to, to, to relate to things that have happened that you've seen. Now, um, on a more specific level – 
there's nothing intrinsically harmful about uh, computers or, no. or screen time. The problem is when, I'll just give you a very simple example. Suppose I have a child, a teenager, that is really struggling with some emotional stress or, or social stress. And God knows that teens have an awful lot of that these days. Rather than dealing with their stress in, in a, a productive, a growth way, and I'll come to that in one second what that might be. Instead, what they do is they go onto the, onto the screen. And what they're really doing is avoidance. What they're really yes. doing is hour after hour. And so in addition to the physiological stress of the system, you know, too long is very draining. You've also not dealt with the stresses that sent you there in the first place. So then we get asked the question, you know, well, what is a good way of dealing with the stress? You know, I've got a teen, the teen's really stressed out. You know, what's a better way? Should they go do yoga? Should they go whatever? Yes. And, <laughs> yes, they should. <laughs> well, yeah, depending on the child, right? Yes. Um, um, you know, each kid, each kid has to find their own. But here's where neuroscience is very interesting. The brain actually has four mechanisms for dealing with stress. And the best one, the most recent one, is called something called social engagement. Really, it's turning to your parents, talking about it. It's reestablishing that connection. That's what helps a kid. But avoiding the stress or trying to suppress the stress, uh, what happens is if you peer beneath the surface, you know, we have various measurements that we look at for what's called ar arousal. And what we find is, you know, that kid who is avoiding stress by, you know, going onto their system for eight hours, underneath the system, under underneath the surface, the heart is beating like crazy. The brain is got is got ramped up arousal. They are burning an awful lot of energy. That's why it's maladaptive. And that, interestingly, is the reason we think that we've seen the tripling in anxiety and depression amongst uh, children and teens. It's because of maladaptive ways of dealing with the stress of lockdown or the stress of, you know, whatever. Well, and when we look at um, the different kinds of stress, right, there is distress, the, 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 the stress that, you know, right, that, that, that comes from, you know, uh, being overloaded by negative events. And then there's the other side of stress, which is eustress, right, the positive side of stress that comes from anticipating, right, anticipating something good, striving for something good. Because there's that there's stress involved with that. Yeah, I, I mean you're making uh, two really really wonderful points, and you're using some cool terms to do it too. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm I'm laughing because I, I feel like some, that's why I get paid the big bucks around here. Yeah, no, but I seriously. don't mean that seriously. I'm just jesting. No, there's not many who know what you just said, but it's a really important point. It is an important point because we think, oh, if we could just get rid of stress. No, no, no. We don't really want to get rid of stress. We just want to learn so, how to deal with it. We need stress, right? Yes. And stress, yes, stress wakes us up. Stress motivates us. We need the challenges. We need what you called you stress, um, which, by the way, was a term that came up with by a Canadian scientist. Um, really? Hans Elie. Yes, Hans Elie. Well, he was Hungarian, but he moved here, so we call him our own. So by no means are we <laughs> do we want to say, well, look, you've got to eliminate stress from your life. The consequences of that or as, are, are as bad as excessive stress. Now, it's the excessive stress that's very, very important. And one of the interesting things for parents to learn, uh, let me give you two things. The first one is, what are the hidden stresses? And there's all kinds of hidden stresses in your life or in your child's life. So to give you a very e simple example, a soft drink, uh, if, you, if a kid is drinking too much of them, that's actually a stress. Parents say, well, yes. you know, how can, you know, how can a soft drink be a stress? Well, the reason is because uh, we have a, a little system in our brain that monitors blood glucose levels, how much sugar is in your bloodstream. And if there's too much sugar in your bloodstream, it has to get rid of it. And what happens is a bunch of uh, physiological mechanisms are triggered to get rid of the excess sugar, to bring it back down to safe levels. Otherwise, it can actually cause brain damage. So 
uh, the pancreas starts to churn out and we are burning an awful lot of energy to, to keep our blood levels safe. Now, you remember, the scientific definition of a stress is anything that requires us to burn energy in order to keep a system going. So here we have a great example. The blood sugar level is an example of how we can be doing something that is having an impact four hours after the fact or the next day. And mm. that's kind of what we're seeing uh, with a lot of, uh, a lot of us today. Um, these hidden stresses in our lives, not the obvious ones, not the money or time or whatever, but hidden stresses, physiological stresses, for example, that are uh, causing us, our, our, our autonomic nervous system to work overtime. You mentioned something about, or you talk about excessive sugar in the body and the rise of diabetes. I mean, I, certainly in the United States and no doubt in other countries as well. And the correlation, what some of the research is showing between um, depression and uncontrolled glucose. So what's really interesting here is that we have these, these systems, these mechanisms that regulate all kinds of things. So they'll regulate, you know, how much hormones we secrete. So let's take as an example um, we have a hormone that we naturally secrete that makes us tired uh, in the evening and, uh, you know, sends us to sleep. But when we are overstressed, and those stresses can be, they can be what you just said. They can be our diet. They can be not just, you know, work or commuting, but they can be little things. What happens is it dysregulates that mechanism. It's that mechanism loses its resilience. It can't get back to normal. And now the next thing we know, uh, we can't fall asleep. We can't stay asleep. Mm. We wake up in the morning and, you know, I've taken, I've, t I've had to take sleep medication and I feel dreadful. I'm just, I'm not recovered. The whole system, uh, and these are complicated systems, has become dysregulated. Now the good news the really good news is we can correct this. The good news is that um, through modern science, modern medicine, we can repair these systems, get them functioning normally. And the same applies to societal stress. Yes, we've gone polarized. Yes, we don't we can't see how to construct our problems. But my own sense, and, you know, I, I I'm, you know, don't want to be a political theorist, but my own sense is there's something happening in the U.S. now. It's this return to what's called homeostasis, this return to balance, addressing the stresses. And this is not a, a quick fix. It will take time. But the signs are a society that will be able to, you know, be what it once was, which was the inspiration for the rest of the world. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue the conversation with Dr. Stuart Shanker. We're talking about his latest book, Reframed, Self-Reg for a Just Society. To learn more, please visit www.selfregglobal.com. And on Twitter, you can find Stuart at Stuart Shanker. And on Facebook, that page is Self-Reg. And on Instagram, Stuart underscore Shanker. Here comes the break. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Hang on just a sec. Before we take a little break, I want to honor a year of hard-won resiliency in spite of all the hardship. But we all have limits and we all get worn out, especially in the face of extended uncertainty. I know, I know, it's frustrating and scary. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed by everything on my plate and miss being able to physically congregate with family and friends. And I especially miss those loving hugs. Ugh, it's a lot to handle. But talking through my fears and anxiety always makes me breathe a little easier and feel hopeful. Taking care of our mental health should not be a luxury, but a self-care necessity. And that's why I'm proud to be partnered with Talkspace Online Therapy and a client. Therapy can really help shift your perspective, teach new tools to cope in difficult times, and be a guiding light in the stormy seas of life. I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace. I really love that Talkspace lets you send and receive unlimited messages 24-7 to your dedicated therapist on the Talkspace platform, and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. Best of all, 
Talkspace is a fraction of the cost and more convenient than in-person therapy. It's like having your own on-call mental health angel. And Talkspace has thousands of licensed therapists trained in more than 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, substance abuse, trauma, anger management, relationship issues, food and eating, and so much more. Talkspace offers a secure and private HIPAA-compliant interactive platform that uses the latest end-to-end bank-grade encrypted technology, providing a safe virtual space to talk it out with your therapist from the comfort and privacy, wherever you are, whenever, and for whatever is on your mind. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com or download the app. Make sure to use the code HAPPINESS to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's HAPPINESS and Talkspace.com. Now let's take that break. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. Welcome back. But before we get back to the conversation, let me celebrate the value of teamwork. This show has been produced by a hardworking team of talented folks for more than 10 years. Hiring great people to realize a common creative goal is like gold. Laszlo Bach, a leading human resources guru, says hiring is the most important people function you have, and most of us aren't as good at it as we think. Refocusing your resources on hiring better will have a higher return than almost any training program you can develop. That means Hiring smart and capable talent to help build your company is one of those things you do not want to mess up. You need to hire the right people if you want to take your business to the next level. And that's why I'm proud to partner with Indeed. Indeed Indeed.com is the number one hiring site in the world and will help you find the high impact hire you need, just like they have for more than 3 million businesses. And Indeed will help you find quality candidates instantly with Indeed's instant match. Unlike other sites, Indeed gives you full control and payment flexibility, delivering a quality shortlist faster. With Indeed, you only pay for what you need, and you can pause your account at any time, and there are no long-term contracts. Indeed searches through millions of resumes in their database to deliver you great candidates instantly. With Instant Match, you see a list of great candidates with zero weight, Who doesn't love instant service and instant gratification? Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined, according to Talent Nest. 73% of online job seekers in the U.S. visit Indeed each month, according to Comscore Total Visits. Want your quality shortlist fast? You need Indeed. Right now, our listeners get a free $75 credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash HH. This is Indeed's best offer available anywhere. Get a free $75 credit at Indeed.com slash HH. Indeed.com slash HH. Offer valid through March 31st. Terms and conditions apply. Now let's get back to the conversation. And we are back continuing the conversation with Dr. Stuart Shanker about the science of becoming a better human and society. Let's get back to it. So, Stuart, let's jump into this notion of reframing, reframing human nature, human development and IQ. So we can give people a sense of what it is that you're offering to help us restore some balance in our lives. Um, so I'm going to answer that as a scientist. Please do. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we we are in the midst of probably the greatest revolution in neuroscience, brain science, that we've ever seen. Uh, and really what it's about is we've discovered, because we have new technology, how critical are the systems that un- that operate below the surface of the brain. So these are called the subcortex or the limbic system. And so what we've learned is there are really different kinds of behavior. There is behavior that's caused 
by these deep limbic systems. And then there's behavior that comes from the surface of the brain, the, the, the prefrontal cortex. Okay, so that's, it. that's enough science. Where it gets so where where it gets so where it gets so relevant is it forces us to distinguish as a parent or as a teacher between misbehavior, and that comes from the front part of the brain, the prefrontal, misbehavior and stress behavior. And stress behavior comes from deep inside the brain. It comes from the limbic system. There are signs of stress behavior and that's, you know, a large part of the books is explaining what are the signs of stress behavior. And we can detect it in things like tone of voice, in a child's <laughs> facial complexion, in their pupils, all these little signs that this is a stress behavior. So now why is it so important? It's important because misbehavior is intentional. That's when the child is lying, say, to get out of trouble. But stress behavior is something very different. A child's stress behaviors are not intentional. They are caused by mechanisms deep inside the brain. And if we punish stress behavior, if we punish it because we think of it, because we, we, we misinterpreted it, we thought it was misbehavior, we actually add to the child's stress load. We make things worse. And this will have all kinds of impacts. So what we're learning is that with this distinction between misbehavior and stress behavior, we can start now to recognize and reframe why a child's having certain kinds of problems. So it could be an academic problem. It could be an emotional problem. We can figure out what are the stresses that are triggering the limbic system, triggering the, these deep processes, and then we can actually change things. We can actually change that that kid's trajectory. We call it releasing the child's limbic brakes. Now, the big discovery we've made is, first of all, there is no such thing as a bad kid, ever. That's important. I agree with okay? that. And the second one is, there is no such thing as a trajectory that we can't change once we understand what are the stresses that have created it in the first place. So that's all the work we do. And that's what the book is about. And being a good model. I mean, th there's a lot of uh, model deficient behavior <laughs> going can on. I, can I, Lisa, can I give a scientific response to that? Yes, please. So one of the really interesting aspects of this new uh, part of the brain that we've tapped into is it turns out that there is a connection between, say, a parent's limbic system, their deep brain, mm -hmm. and the child's limbic system. And it's called limbic resonance. And what happens is we communicate, if we're irritated with our child, if we're angry, if we're disappointed, whatever, that information is transmitted way before, way faster than anything we might say. So what, what the child is actually hearing is what's going on inside your limbic system. And in order for us to how to be able to change these trajectories, in order for us to help the, help the child um, you know be their best, whatever, we have to reframe. We have to see this child differently. See the child differently, you see a new child. Your own limbic messages are transformed. Your, your tone of voice has changed. The gentleness in your eye is changed. This is what the child picks up. So, you know, bottom line, self-regulation, if you're working with a kid, self-regulation, the emphasis is on self. Do your self-regulation, work on, you know, you know, work on all this stuff for your own uh, calmness, and that radiates. You lend your calmness to the child, and that has this hugely calming effect. So when we look at what you just said, the modeling, uh, we try to explain this now in terms of what's called the triune revolution in neuroscience. This is interesting stuff. Triune? Spell that. Yeah. T-R-I-U-N-E. So it was a discovery made by an American neuroscientist back in the 60s, and he wrote a book about it, called, a guy called Paul McLean. He wrote a book in 1990 called The Triune Brain. And basically what he said was, you know, we have different levels of, of neural 
functioning. We have the, the neocortex, the new part of our brain, but underneath that, we have the limbic system, and then deep at the bottom, we have the reptilian brain. The reason this is huge is because now it enables us to begin to see my kid is actually, you know, uh, I mean, I tell a story in Reframe, this one little, this one team we were working with, and he kept on, uh, he got in trouble and kept on saying, I don't care, I don't care. And that made the uh, teachers absolutely nuts. Uh, and, uh, you know, they started ratcheting up, you better care, mister, or you're in a lot of trouble. But in fact, I don't care was Olympic utterance. And what it really meant was I'm scared to death. All I want to do is get out of here. And so what we did to help him was tone it down, stop threatening, stop explaining, let him feel safe again. And now you could see everything about him. His whole body changed, his eyes changed. And now we can begin to uh, explain to him he'd done something inappropriate. And he had to learn that it was inappropriate. But when that child is it, when that teen is in high alarm, and, and you're going to assault him, uh, the lesson will not be learned. And in fact, um, you are entrenching uh, what's going to become a serious problem, you know, down the road. What I'm hearing loud and clear by what you're not saying, but the message is coming <laughs> through to me, is that, you know, when we talk about creating a just society, that these changes start at the, the individual level, right? That that. This change yep. begins inside as the parent, as the community leader, as, yes. the, as the teacher. And when yes. we are right within ourselves and we demonstrate this behavior yes. towards the youngsters in our lives, that's where the revolution occurs. So maybe, Lisa, you could send us a transcript and we will just steal everything you just said. That was, that, that, <laughs> I could be part of your marketing team. <laughs> you know, that, that, was, that was perfect. Yes, that's exactly the point. Yeah, it's brilliant because the fix is in the practice. Yes. The corrective action is that that just repetition over and over and over again so the habits shift. Can I give you one sort of inspirational message for the end? Yes, please. Um, so we do, I told you, you know, we do work all over Canada and the north. And uh, I was doing some work in the very far north in Yellowknife. And it was the end of January. And they had to change the venue to a theater. And it was packed out. It was SRO. Wow. And it was minus 42. Okay. So at the very end of the night, I said, you know, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you guys something because I don't get it. It's minus 42. What the hell are you all doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and a little voice from the top of the balcony shouts down, it's because you give us hope. Yeah. And that's really stuck with me. And that's what parents need to hear now. And that's what our society needs to hear. You know, without, without hope, we are, we're out of business. I mean, it is the, it is that hope that is, you know, that pilot light of possibility. Like, you know, we can change things and we are, you know, we have, yes. you know, there are people having conversations like this all over the world because we see that, that there's a possibility for it to be different. Yes. Yes. And now what we have to do is we need, we need the hands on. We need what you mentioned before. We need the practical now to guide us. Yeah. My guest today has been the fabulous Dr. Stuart Shanker. The book we've been speaking about is Reframed, Self-Reg for a Just Society. To learn more about Stuart and the work he is doing around the world, www.selfregglobal.com. On Twitter at Stuart Shanker. On Facebook, that page is Self Reg. And on Instagram, that handle is Stuart underscore Shanker. Here comes a pause. We'll be right back. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. And we're back, continuing the conversation about what it means to be awake and aware, the science of becoming a better human and society. My next guest is Jim Davies, Ph.D., 
Dr. Jim Davies is professor of cognitive science and author of three books, Riveted, Imagination, and Being the Person Your Dog Thinks You Are. He's an award-winning teacher and researcher and the co-host of the podcast, Minding the Brain. And we're talking about his newest book today, which is really essentially the science of a better you. So, Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to talk to you, Lisa. Well, you approach your writing and life through a very interesting lens. And I'd love for you to talk about what it means from a scientific perspective to be a good person. So a good person, great question. I think that there are several aspects to being good. You know, one is the moral aspect. I mean, a lot of people want to be You know, they don't want to be bad people or whatever, Uh, but there's also a sense of, you know, the goodness of being happy and healthy and all that kind of thing. Um, The kind of thing I talk about in the book are mostly psychological goodness, so productivity and happiness and uh, and morality. Uh, And my approach is scientific, which means that rather than just talking about like feelings about what makes you happy, I uh, when there is science available, I look at the science and make recommendations based on that. So when we talk about the science of optimizing our life, which is really Mm. what this book is about. Talk a little bit about the three components that you address in order for us to optimize our lives. Sure, sure. Well, happiness is something that just about everybody wants. Uh, They might use a slightly different word for it. Um, But, you know, most people want to be happy or want to be happier than they are. Um, And uh, there's a whole lot of scientific research about you know what makes us happy, what makes us sad, and where we're wrong about that, and also the 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 the, the, amp, the degree, right? Like <laughs> this thing is really effective, and this thing makes almost no difference at all. And I think in the news, a lot of people hear that you know this food makes you healthier or this thing makes you happier, but the it often isn't reported how large an effect it is, right? So I wanted to write a book that talked about okay, like well, what things really matter and what things don't matter. Uh, I actually came up with a. a a phrase, uh, what matters, what unmatters and what anti matters. <laughs> and the, the things that anti matter are the things that you think do good, but actually make things worse. Right. And so, you know, I apply that to, uh, your own happiness and your own, uh, positive effects on the world around you. Uh, and then productivity, you know, once you've got it set in your mind, like, you know, how you are going to try to make yourself happier and a better person, having productivity recommendations helps you amplify uh, achieving those goals. And then the the third component you said is the the goodness aspect or like mm. you and I were talking prior to starting this this recording, menschhood, you know, being a mensch. Right. Right. It's very difficult for people to compare the goodness of things that they might do. Uh, and so one thing I try to do is put everything in a common currency so you can actually compare, you know, how uh, how good it is to say hi to your neighbor versus Uh, working at a food bank. Morality is a kind of a fraught philosophical minefield, right? So what I tried to do is pick some unit of currency, so to speak, that everybody pretty much agrees is good. And that was saving one year of human life. And what I mean by that is not necessarily extending somebody's old age, but, you know, if someone were to die a year early, preventing that happening so that they actually got that year of life uh, is I think almost everybody thinks is a good thing in general. So what I tried to do is put everything, you know, think about everything that somebody might imagine is uh, a good thing to do in terms of the equivalent of saving a year of somebody's life. <laughs> and I would say a lot of people would uh, push back on this, right? Because in their view, it's subjective. Uh, yeah. So I think there is some degree of subjectivity. So for example, like we can't really, well, it would be challenging to measure how much good helping an old lady cross the street is. We'd have to factor in her probability of getting hurt, her anxiety, uh, how much happier it made her um, to have that happen to her. Um, But I think it's possible, right? But even if there is a range of what people would guess of how many times you'd have to help an old lady cross the street to be equivalent good to um, extending somebody's life by a year, I think everybody would agree that the number would be fairly large. You know, <laughs> yes, yes. And that's what I encourage people to think, even if they, you know, the, the, I, I want people to try to think about it in those terms. And I don't really fuss that much about the exact numbers because it's a book of science. And what that means is that the numbers that I put in the book and I do put in numbers are not set. In, you know, they're not set in stone. Better data is going to replace them. So what's really important is the way you think about it. And 
put in your own numbers. I don't mind. Just, you know, I, I encourage people to think a little bit more in terms of magnitudes rather than just is it good or is it bad, for example. So what I'm hearing is that what you're talking about is optimizing our actions for ourselves and the greater good. Yes. Right. So it's the most bang for the buck, the most um, uh, outcome for the energy invested. Yep, absolutely. And that's for, uh, you know, for happiness everything. as well as morality. Right? Yes. And productivity as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You yeah. know, I'm, it's a, there's a good analogy with investments. When somebody, if somebody were to come up, you know, in a, in a green vest were to come up to you on the street and say, hey, would you invest $50 in this business? You wouldn't just say yes without like asking, you know, well, what's the return? Like, what, you know, <laughs> you'd compare it to other things you might invest in. But for some reason, people aren't that way with charities. They're, they're much more opportunistic and, oh, yeah, that sounds good and I'll do it. Uh, I think a lot of people don't think it's possible to measure the goodness. And, uh, and up until about 15 years ago, they'd be absolutely right. It's really only recently that we've been able to evaluate charities, for example, in a way that allows us to uh, actually know how much good it's doing. And when we talk about charitable gifts and, and who, we, who or what we give money to, I am partial to veterans causes, for example. I really think that we as Americans down here um, owe it to um, our fellow service men and women to support them when they return home from service. On the other hand, it's easier to raise money for a pet cause than it is to raise money to support men and women who have gone off to war. Um, and then there's the further question of how far does that money go to actually doing good, right? Yeah. So an, and to make another example, it's a lot easier or people are more interested in putting in money to save uh, pet animals like cats and dogs than they are to improve the conditions of factory farms where many more animals are affected, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, like people, uh, the average American eats – um, eats about 30 animals a year and almost all of those are chickens, right? Uh, you, you have to eat beef for many years to eat a, a single cow. So, um, you know, it's really a stark contrast. I can eat a chicken in one meal. I used to do that in my twenties. I could eat an entire chicken in one meal. Um, but people get like bent out of shape about a single cat, right? So, so there, it really is, um, I think, I think that being good does require a little bit deeper thinking than, uh, the pulling on your heartstrings that often works in how charities advertise, for example. Yeah. And the biases that we hold. I think that, you know, this conversation also needs to look at that, right? Depending upon our culture and where we are in life and where we live in life, we are going to have different biases about this subject. Yeah. Biases, is, that's one way to put it. I mean, they're, they're cultural differences, right? And there are cultural differences in values and this kind of thing. You know, I try to finesse that a little bit by, as I said, putting it in a kind of currency that everyone can understand and, and everyone kind of agrees on, like, a, you know, saving a year of human life. Uh, where it gets challenging is when you try to compare, mm, let's say, let's say saving a chicken from a factory farm. How much suffering are you actually relieving compared to human suffering for year, uh, living a one fewer year of life? Yeah. And that's, of course, going to be very controversial, but I do my best to be fair about it. And when we talk about happiness, you know, this show has been this show has been going on for 11 years. We've been we've been uh, dissecting the subject. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's been around a long time. Um, but And the reason it's probably existed for so long is because happiness is so elusive. Right. It's it's something that we all want. We all know it when we experience it, although it's you know, subtly different for each of us, but why is it so hard to sustain? Well, first of all, I want to say that most people are pretty happy. Um, when you ask people to rate their life satisfaction, uh, that's sort of like a reflective idea of how happy they are with their life so far. Uh, and when you measure their moment to moment happiness, when you randomly ping them and say, how are you feeling right now? Both of them show that people do tend to be pretty happy. Um, but it is also true that people tend to focus on the negative and would like to make it a little bit better. Uh, I do want to say two things. One is that looking for information about happiness, or you might think a secret to happiness, doesn't really work because becoming happier is not about knowing anything. It is about changing how you live. And changing how you live is about changing your habits and what you do every day and how you react to things. And that takes 
you know, training in a sense. You have to practice it and get better at it and get into the habit of doing things that make you happier. So the secrets to happiness, and we can talk about what the best candidates for those are, are probably things your listeners have heard many times, but just knowing, for example, that getting enough sleep will make you ha happier doesn't mean that you're going to start <laughs> suddenly getting enough sleep. Am I right? <laughs> Correct. Because the, the getting enough sleep requires an intervention and a shift in order to make that happen, right? You've got to power down earlier. You've got to, you've got to sort of reorganize how you prioritize your life. There, there are things that we have to do. And I think that that's where the, um, the frustration comes in, right? We all know it. It's like losing weight. We all say, oh, I probably love to lose five pounds and we all know how to do it. And yet it's so hard to do. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to put it. There's like for some things that you want to change in your life, there are infrastructure things that that make it challenging, right? You you know, having young children makes it hard to get more sleep and, you know, rearranging your schedule. You have obligations to other people in your household, right? Um, so there's that. Um, but there's also just like the notion of a habit. And I talk a lot about how to change your habits, both for productivity and for happiness, because you've got a bunch of habits. And if your conscious mind, your deliberative, like, conscious thinking, like what's going through your head at any given moment, if that is at all distracted by something else, you will revert to those habits. And that's why just knowing that you should do something doesn't mean you're going to do it all the time because you cannot have the vigilance to be constantly thinking about that thing, right? Like having something for breakfast. If you do the same thing every single morning, then eventually it does not become a, it becomes a non-decision, Yeah. right? If you like um, make yourself coffee every morning, with cream and sugar, eventually you will habituate to the cream and sugar. You will stop getting pleasure from it. It will just be expected. You will do it without thinking. You won't get much happiness out of it. But on the flip side, if you have something healthful for breakfast every morning, like lately I've been chopping up cabbage and green chilies with one egg and making like a hash. And if you, you know, if you, and you might not even think that's the most tasty thing to have for breakfast compared to like Fruit Loops, but if you can get into a habit about it, then you don't need to think about it anymore. And you can wake up thinking about your meetings or your whatever, and you'll still end up eating the healthy thing without even thinking about it. Let's jump off and take a break. And when we come back, we will carry on with the conversation with Professor Jim Davies. We're talking about being the person your dog thinks you are, the science of a better you. To learn more about Jim's work, please go to jimdavies.org and his podcast, which is mindingthebrainpodcast.com. On Twitter, you can find him at Dr. Jim Davies and on Facebook at the same handle, Dr. Jim Davies. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life, a boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness, is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound and HarvestingHappiness.com. back continuing the conversation with Jim Davies about what it means to be awake and aware, the science of becoming a better human and society. Let's get back to it. Jim, let's get back to these changes. You talked about the healthy breakfast that you've been making for yourself. So it becomes something that you don't have to think about it. You get up, mm -hmm. you, you make this meal of a hash and you get on with your day. So you're optimizing your routine in service to the greater good in your household as well as your own? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's one way to put it. You know, you've got good habits and bad habits. And I think that that maintaining and, and monitoring those habits and trying to make them work for your greater values is something that people should be doing their whole lives. And when we talk about wanting to be a good person, you know, I think most of us will say, you know, I just want to be a good person or I just want to do good or at least I don't want to do harm. What should somebody do if this is part of their their life plan, their conscious life plan? I just want to do good. I want to be good. Oh, that's such that's a really big question. I yeah. mean, if I, if I had to give a very short answer, it would be to donate as much money as you possibly can to the Against Malaria Foundation. <laughs> yeah, because that, that's an organization that is near, near and dear to your heart, but also saves the most lives with the least amount of money. Yeah. So it's not, I would, I, I would, I don't even want to say it's near and dear to my heart. It actually, the data supports that it is one of the most effective charities for doing good. And I would, you know, you know, we were talking about like comparing 
you know, helping somebody across the street to saving a, a life. Uh, I personally believe that if you donated maybe $200 a year for five years to this charity, you would do more good than you would have done in your entire life otherwise. It's so much more effective than almost anything you can do that one of the things I realized in doing this, the analysis that was required to do this book is that many of the things that we consider good and bad day to day, ultimately really they're negligible compared to how much you donate to save people from malaria. I don't think in the United States and in Canada, we are as aware of just how deadly malaria can be. Oh, it's deadly and it's awful. I have a friend who had malaria and he said it was like he wanted to die. It was so bad and he recovered. <laughs> so it's a, it's a terrible, it's a terrible scourge on the world, but it's not because it's a terrible scourge that makes it bad, really. I mean, that's part of it, of course. There are lots of diseases and ways to die that are terrible. It's just that preventing people from getting malaria is incredibly cheap. Uh, you know, deworming is another really effective way to make people's lives better. And, you know, when you compare it to like uh, donating money to a museum or whatever, I provide tools that you can use to think about how much good that donation would do. And you can compare it to you know, what it would do for the Against Malaria Foundation, <laughs> for example. So that's what I think. You know, people have this notion of being good about like uh, feeling good about what you're doing. And even I'm subject to this. Like I, I was walking one summer just just down the block to get a bubble tea. And I passed this like very poor person waiting for a bus and he had no shoes on. And I said, dude, where are your shoes? And, and he said he didn't have any. He was trying to get on the bus. And, and I looked at his feet and I asked him what size he was. I gave him the shoes on my feet. And I went, you know, to the bubble tea barefoot, you know, they were shoes that were not brand new or whatever. It wasn't a huge loss to me. And I have to say that I feel better about that than all the money I've donated to the Against Malaria Foundation and also charities for helping animals, which are very effective, even though that was extremely minor. Yeah. <laughs> but my monkey brain, it like, you know, bring almost brings tears to my eyes to think about that in a way that... Um, you know, writing a check doesn't, but that's where some of your intuitions can lead you astray with what's actually the best thing to do. And when we talk about intuition as it relates to goodness or doing good, you advocate for that. And intuition is kind of an amorphous thing, right? It's You can't really calculate it, can you? Well, I think you can. Intuition. So let's just talk about intuition from a scientific perspective. Uh, you know, when people casually use intuition, what they usually referred to is a strong feeling or judgment or a uh, way to act that they can't particularly articulate the reasons for. Um, so they might try to come up with reasons later, um, but basically it's kind of a, a gut, they sometimes call it a gut feeling. Now, where do these come from? Well, some of them are extremely learned behaviors, right? And some of these are genetic, right? So our uh, love for sugary things is, is probably genetic and, and a bit learned. Um, so these are the intuitions. So the question becomes, should you trust your gut or should you not? And there's no uh, clear answer to this. Sometimes you should trust your gut and sometimes you shouldn't. <laughs> um, but, see, but if I could give one piece of general advice, it would be this. If the situation you're dealing with is one that is very similar to something that our ancient ancestors might have encountered, then trust your gut. Okay, so our ancient ancestors living on the savanna in Africa did not have insurance policies. They did not have you know, a high tech, this and that, you know, they had fear of, of dangerous people. They had predators, they had, they had, you know, so if, if this situation is a little bit similar to that, then maybe you trust your gut because it did our ancestors. Well, most of our instincts evolved during that period, but your gut about which insurance policy to buy is probably wrong because there are people out there trying to manipulate you, right? So the people who make the, the choices for the insurance, they know which one's going to feel best to your gut. And they're going to make that choice the one that benefits them the most. So even though it's difficult and challenging, right, that's where you should use reason and logic and defy your gut instinct, especially when there are very smart people out there trying to manipulate you with it. Cool. We can talk about this for hours. I mean, reason, logic, <laughs> accountability, discernment, critical thinking. Yeah, you know, I think critical thinking is great, you know, but I, I also think that it can it can lead people astray. Like I said, I don't think people should ignore their gut all the time. Um, sometimes you'll get a strong feeling of distrust or whatever. And sometimes that might be due to racism or sexism or something. And of course you should question it then. But other times, just because you can't articulate why it's wrong, doesn't mean it isn't wrong. 
you know, and, and, and logic and reason and critical thinking are all about conscious processes of beliefs you can articulate and this kind of thing. And uh, it's not always the best way to go. I think I have found myself in the last several years wanting to tear the hair out of my head at, at, at times. And this is coming from, you know, a positive psychology person. When, when I look at the state of affairs externally and then I go, okay, well, the only thing I can really, really change is myself and my actions. So we're going to start there, which can kind of bring us back to the conversation. Right, right. Well, your actions can do a lot. <laughs> yeah, they can. So we, we better be smart with the use of those actions and invest wisely, right. which really goes back thematically to what we're talking about with the book. Mm -hmm. To be productive in affecting change, what do you think is the, the primary kernel there? Well, being productive in general, I think, is mostly about focused work on projects, right? Now, be, now being productive in terms of being good is relatively easy. You just write a check once a year to the, the best charity that's out there. So that's not <laughs> a really, um, you, it's not really a productivity hack. But if we're talking about our day-to-day -day, um, behaviors and stuff, um, this is really a ripe area for looking at our uh, intuitions versus our critical thinking. So I'll give an example of, of smartphones, which are very interesting pieces of technology in our universe because they are supercomputers that are always available and offer a effectively limitless amount of information, some of which is interesting and some of which isn't, but it basically works like a roulette wheel. And so people can get addicted to their phones and particularly when the phones notify them, they can be constantly interrupted. So interruptions are the bane of productivity. And there are two basic kinds. There's external interruptions, and that might be an email coming in or somebody approaching your desk at work. Uh, or your phone notifying you. And then there are internal interruptions, which are more about like your own focus and being distracted by other things that pop into your mind. I think that if someone can manage to remove distraction from their life, it's almost like a superpower. And it's like a superpower because so many people are bad at it. Yeah. I teach a class of 300 students and I asked, I said, okay, everybody, don't look at your notifications for this class. <laughs> Good and luck with the, that. At the end of class, I want you to look at your phones and tell me how many you got. And they did. And I was like, you know, shocked at the number because I've turned off almost all my notifications. <laughs> but some people check their notifications every time they come in and they even respond to them. And studies of interruption show that this is incredibly damaging to your concentration, right? Some, some kids even leave their notifications on at night and get woken up by them so they can respond immediately. And that's, this is just a disaster. So, you know, if I had to give one major communication that would help people be productive and, and, and to get them to be better working on the things that they're going to be proud of, it would be to re reduce distractions. And one of the biggest offenders for distraction is the smartphone and its yeah. notifications. What does the science have to say about working from home on our productivity? Everyone's going to be a little different because some people's home environments are very distracting, particularly if they have young children. But the science says that on average, working from home makes you more productive. But that's a very specific measure of success, okay? When you are at work and around colleagues, you are more creative. So here's how it breaks down. If you know what you need to do, if you have some cut and dried things, you just need to crank through it and get it done. You need a distraction-free environment where you can concentrate and work very hard and get through it. For many people, working from home provides that environment. However, if you are in an early stages of a project, maybe you're still trying to define the, you know, the, the constraints of the problem. Maybe you're looking for the solution of how to do it. Maybe you don't know even the right approach. In that situation, being around other people, and indeed, even interruptions, you're walking to the bathroom and you run into somebody in the hallway and end up talking for five minutes, that kind of environment is better for creativity. So if I were to describe an ideal work environment, and this is for mostly for information work, right? If you work on an assembly line, of course, you can't work from home, right? But um, you would be able to have opportunities to work undistracted, whether that's a private office where you can close the door with no window or work from home for the times when you need to be productive, but shared meals, chance encounters in the hallway, et cetera, for the creative, the creative work. I love it. My guest today has been Dr. Jim Davies. Uh, to learn more about Jim's work and his books and his podcast, please go to jimdavies.org or mindingthebrainpodcast.com on Twitter at Dr. Jim Davies and Facebook as well, Dr. Jim Davies. 
Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress-Kamen and my guest, Dr. Stuart Shanker and Jim Davies, Ph.D., wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Go out and rock your day. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.